that's where we finished just before the break was about the importance to remember that the business only exists to serve a customer. So let's get into price. switch this on. So, anybody want to give me a definition of price? Okay, dollar figure that we charge, which is what that graph says. It's one particular figure, it's dollars we charge for our service. That's the most common definition given, but it doesn't really cover what price is all about. Because that is looking at price as an absolute number. And price is not only an absolute number. So except for when it isn't. So we can have discounts, rebates, hate discounts, but in the elements, realities that are out there. We can have auctions, there is no definitive price, whether they're a traditional auction or a Dutch auction. We can have a, an auction scenario, so we might have a starting point, not always, but we certainly don't have an end point until such time as the room, room or whatever the scenario is, whether it's eBay, whatever, has determined the price, but it's certainly not an absolute figure. When there's negotiation, I'm sure I'll there's different industries here, there's the building game, there's accounting, there's uh, all sorts of industries in the room and I'm sure all of you have negotiated at some point with your customers. So you might have started with a fixed price, an absolute price, but it certainly probably didn't end there. Depending on whether they want it quicker or earlier, price can alter, later or off peak, seasonality. Suddenly the absolute price is starting to get a few different variations. When you pay for it may impact price. Don't always necessarily think of that having an impact on price. Payment terms is a huge impact. Or we can make it have a huge impact in our business. Prepaid, now, instalments, all different, there's you know, there's many different ways there. There's a bonuses. There's bundling and unbundling, or packaging and, and stripping the packages out. There's tiered pricing. So there's many different ways instead of just looking at an absolute number. There's distribution option going for volume, quantity options and quality options. So it's called temptation pricing, depending on what model you want. So there's different ways of looking at price. It is not just an absolute number. We'll go into some of those in a little detail now, but it is, price is never an absolute number. Whether it's from negotiation from our customer, whether it's negotiation from us, whether it's from how we present it, whether it's how it's paid, whether it's when it's delivered, all of these aspects can come into it never an absolute number for the same product or service. So I want to talk about the 1% aspect here. At an absolute minimum, I want people to be able to increase their prices by 1%. I'm not necessarily talking about 10, 50, 100%, though that would be nice. If all we can do is 1% constantly, when I say constantly, I mean every appropriate increment. If we were able to get that extra price margin, then we've got a great business. We're not necessarily always looking at the 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50 percent. Kim yesterday spoke about the 1 percenters in, in looking at it from an internal focus, and I'm looking at it now from the 1 percenters from the price focus. And sure, I'd love you to get 10 percent more and 50 percent more. But if all you can get is 1% and your costs stay the same, that 1% drops straight to the bottom line. So the 1%, well, depending on your cost structure, will have a much greater than 1% profit impact. Much greater. Hugely greater. So it's not about radical price increases that I'm after. 
It's about constantly looking at how we can get one, two, three percent better. And that's going to have that cumulative impact. It's like Kim talking about constantly looking at those one percenters in your business and the cumulative impact. He talked about two years of building those systems, and now four years down the track, but he talked about the first two years of putting those one percenters in place in the, from a systems internal point of view. The same comments can be made about the one percenters looking at it from your pricing point of view and over a period of time, the impact on your bottom line is going to be huge. So if your net margin is 10%, 1% of your revenue dropping the bottom line is massively impact. If it's 50%, it's still a significant um, improvement on your bottom line. So we don't, I'm going to be talking about 10s and 20s and 30s and 40% for the next little while, but also remember that if we can just get that little extra, better than what our like businesses in our industries, if we can get better just by that smidgen this quarter, next quarter, the quarter after, the cumulative impact on your bottom line is going to be massive. So let's uh, start with a, a question. What is fair value? Maybe we'll have, uh, say, a minute at the table to think about what is fair value. If we could have some music, please, while we think about that. And then I'd like some people to tell me what fair value is. OK, what's fair value? I have an iMac on my desk. I have an iPad. 
an iPhone, maybe a couple of iPads. Got a couple of iPods, probably in the house is one of how many iPods. So yes, I spend a bit of Apple. If I'm searching on the, on the web, and I go onto a particular website, and it's got what's called dynamic pricing enabled, and they can tell, because of IT geeks, that I'm using an Apple to search for this particular item. Is it fair that they charge me more than a person who's searching on a Windows computer? Is that fair? Yes, because I've got a Windows computer. <laughs> It's not really fair? Well, it's not fair that iTunes sell their songs in the United States for 99 cents and we pay $1.99 for exactly the same thing out. And there's no extra cost. Just because of the industry. Okay, so suddenly you're getting a different perspective on fair now. Yeah? Um, so, the fact that I'm an Apple... Yes, it is fair. It is fair? Yeah. Why? Well, you, you go to Apple for a specific... Um, you're there... You're, it's a, it's a different experience. Yeah, but this is not on buying Apple products. This is when I'm buying another product, but because they can track that I'm an Apple user, they charge me more. Well, they think you've got more money. Right? <laughs> 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 so, so some of these fairs are starting to just have some little twists. Yeah. Let's put another example, and this happens. That story about buying app, uh, if you're using an Apple on some websites, absolutely is going on right now. Really? Dynamic pricing, they can track what sort of computer you're using and charge different prices accordingly. Right. Is that because they've categorized you? Like yeah, it's segmentation. It's going right back yeah. to the popcorn. Yeah. An Apple user has yeah. a certain profile, a certain demographic, a certain identity, and they usually know that Apple users as a generalized statement, have a higher disposable income than PC users. Right? So they go, we can charge them more. Segmentation. But it's the fact that you didn't know that made it unfair. Right? But because we're not pricing, I know what is going on. So I'll give another example just to challenge your point of view on fair. <coughs> Sorry, I couldn't read that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, if you um, Bunnings Masters, and suddenly um, there's likelihood of huge storms to hit Brisbane, and or floods, even when the floods were about to happen, certain products are more in demand, should they increase the price of those? Because they're more in demand. They shouldn't. It's all about supply and demand. It's not all about supply and demand, because he assume the demand is there. You, you know, the demand is there because you're in Brisbane, you need this, you've got to make your property secure before the flood hit or the, the storms. The so the demand is there. The value is gone up with the item. You're going to sell more than usual. It's a sort of willing buyer, sort of. Got to have it. So, so, so suddenly fair has a different angle. No, you really, really need a value. Really, really it's illegal. It's, really it's not illegal. No way it's happening every day in Bunnings. <laughs> Let me tell you, prices change in Bunnings based on weather. They've got the like, software happening now. Weather changes the prices. They've got dynamic pricing happening in Bunnings now. Right? My stock sake sale that's going to be coming up the Christmas, January months, you know? Right? <coughs> this will be happening for the first time in Maya, in Australia, what I'm about to talk about, and I'll ask about whether it's fair. Um, it's been happening in the United States for a couple of years, and it's coming to Australia. So, when if you get in there, um, whatever time they open, it's crazy time they open, they do it a bit different in New South to Queensland, but the times they open on Boxing Day for the Boxing Day sale, sorry I meant. Um, if you get in there the first half hour, the prices will be a certain price, the next half hour they'll be dearer, the next half hour they'll be dearer, the next half hour they'll be dearer. Is that fair? So they're creating a <laughs> yeah. So 
the suddenly fair value had all these other connotations when I started to talk about dynamic pricing. Right? So it's not always about, it's all about perception. And it's all about transparency. It's the fact that we don't know that gets us uncomfortable. If we know, we can live with it. And in our business, we're going to remember that in how we're pricing. It's not saying we don't have to have different prices for different people, different services, different times, whatever. It's the fact of how we're positioning it. And fair value is all about perception, but it's all about, it's perceived as unfair when it's seen to be hidden. And the reality is the software is so, you know, the bigger companies who can have the IT budgets can change the price every second. So in the States, they have the Cyber Monday and the Black Friday sales, internet, and all of the big parts, all the whole lot of it, everything just goes crazy with these huge one-day sales. And most of the big organisations have dynamic pricing happening. So the price is changing at all the time through the day for the same product. Because they know that the bargain hunter will be there at five in the morning buying, a little bit more relaxed to be there at nine o'clock in the morning so they can pay a bit more. Self-selecting. So fair value, just be really careful of it because when we think of it from a business side, you gave different answers to when I then put in the customer's shoes, and then when I started talking about some of the things that are hidden, I suddenly start changing it. So the lesson out of fair value is transparency in our pricing. It's the way that we can get a premium price and not be perceived as ripping people off, is being transparent about how we're not transparent necessarily about our cost. That's not the transparency I'm talking about. Nobody cares about the cost when you buy things. It's been transparent how we're doing it and why we're charging that and positioning the story properly. That's when it's then we can be so much dearer than anybody else and not be perceived as rip-off merchants. So fair value is something to be You are what you charge. You are what you charge. So I've got Apple up there, and there's a reason why I put Apple up there. It's an incredible story. Um, the technology that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak create, used to create the first Apple products a lot of that technology came from Xerox for free. Why did Xerox not capitalize on what they had? They had what was then revolutionary, the mouse, which was the Apple were the first users of that. And they had the graphical interface that became the Apple sort of interface that then Windows copied. Um, but it all started in Park, Palo Alto Research Center for Xerox. That was where it was all. And Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak got shown through and the technician sat down with them and went through how they built it. And Bill Gates also got a tour. Um, but they gave that away. Why did that happen? What business decision led Xerox give it away and let Apple to be able to basically come into being and be a success. It, sorry. Now that they sort of knew what they had, they couldn't work out how to price it. So Xerox at the time has a business model that was paid per sheet. Photocopiers were paid per sheet. And their whole business model was focused around that service sense that how much you used the photocopier and the similar devices was how much you paid. And they couldn't work out how to this thing that was going to be called a computer, how could they charge for it? Xerox could not work it out. And as crazy as that sounds, in hindsight, they had in you know, New York City of Xerox, they sat in a board meeting 
And the minutes are all out in public domain. You can just search for them now. It's just crazy to think of this. And they could not work out how to price it. And as a result, said, oh, it's worthless. Because their business model was around per sheep. So in essence, they were selling sheep. Photocopy did it, but they were selling sheep. Right? And as a result, they couldn't work out a different business model for this thing that had a mouse and a graphical interface. Couldn't work out how to price it. As crazy as that sounds now. But it's happening in businesses all over the place. Even to this day, you are what you charge. How you charge, the way you charge, what you charge is so impacted on the whole business. And you've got to be careful that you don't lock yourself in as a result as well. But it has such a massive impact. How you charge, the money you charge, your position, you are what you charge in so many ways, shapes, and forms. Xerox left the computer industry. <coughs> Apple and then Microsoft picked up purely because one could work out a different pricing model than the other. And that was it. Nothing else. If we could get this sheet handed out, it's telling you. So there's a little sheet that a little exercise. So the sheet that's coming around, I'm picking on Apple again. But I want you to, when you get it all, it's the third quarter of 2013 financial figures for Apple and the previous two quarters. So it's the revenue and the units sold. And we're just going to do a little exercise on it when everybody's got the sheet to just have a look at what price is telling you about Apple. You know, I know uh, not everybody probably came with a calculator, but if you've got your phones, you can work it out. Does anybody else need a sheet? Okay. So what we've got here is the last three financial years, uh, Fed quarter, sorry, and the units. Now, just for everybody in here, the revenue is in millions. The units are in absolute numbers. Um, so what I would like you to do is with ex exercise is we're going to work out what the average sale price is happening for these products. And then we're going to just drill into what might be going on inside Apple. Just to, because of, I want to talk about average sale price. So, um, so just remembering the revenue is in millions and the units are in absolute numbers. So it's 18 million, 154,000, the iPhone in quarter three, 2013, and 31,241 units. So just a bunch of table, can you work out the average sale price for the iPhone, the iPad, and the Mac? We don't need to worry about iPods, etc. the rest, just the iPhone, iPad, and the Mac. So if I give you a couple of minutes and if we could have some music, please. And then we'll talk about what this story says. That's the average sale price. What we're trying to work out for over these last three quarters. So there's nine numbers for each of these product lines. So the iPhone, the first, just the, uh, just I probably made it a little bit harder. These boxes go from 12 to 13, whereas the red figures here go the other way around. So just be careful of that, sorry. But <laughs> Sorry about that. I know you don't like playing with numbers on a Saturday. There's a couple of accountants in the room, so ask them if you need help. <laughs> Sorry. 
Okay. How are we going with that? <laughs> Does somebody want to give me what the quarter 12, quarter 3, 2012 average sale price of the iPhone? 607. Sorry? 607. 607? 607 will be fine. Quarter, the Quarter two of 2013? 6.13. And quarter three of 13? 5.85. Okay. So what's that telling you? The iPhone average sale price for that quarter. I have no inside knowledge other than what I can get publicly in Apple. But what, so everything I'm going to be talking about is just drawn from the financial statements, etc., that they publicly release. I don't have any inside, side, insider knowledge. But what's that, what's the story that average sale price is showing us here? Or might be showing us here? Beg your pardon? Maybe. What was it? Which? Yeah. Okay. So, so um, when it's at release versus later in the life cycle. Okay, what else might this be saying? They've put it up at Christmas. Put it up at Christmas, it might be saying. So I'll put here that maybe seasonality. Higher price when there's higher demand. So, mm -hmm. Okay, so next model being an issue. Supply. Supply could be an issue. Competition, somebody mentioned. Who here tracks average sale price of their product lines, service lines in their business? Now, Apple's pretty easy because they've got a product called iPhone that's such an easy one to segment. Some of your businesses mightn't be as easy to segment. You still should be looking at average sale price anyhow in your business and what's happening. But let's just have a look at this story before we go on to the next two products. But let's stick on the iPhone for a minute. Um, were anybody surprised by those dollars? <laughs> so you were expecting it to be a thousand dollars or eight hundred or something like that instead of the six hundreds and high fives. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What else? We've talked about release. We've talked about next model supply competition. We've talked about potentially a seasonality impact. Anything else could be in this story. So, because well, not as expected, or so that they might not have been happy with sales, but that's not necessarily um, being told in this story. But that's been told in the absolute number that they sold thirty-one thousand in one particular period, and they sold twenty-six thousand in another. 37,000 in another period. So, but in the average sale price, it tells a different, it doesn't tell you quite that story. Let's have a look at release versus later issue. 
and the pricing that goes along with that. Do you think Apple reduced their price at all? No. 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 So, bigger pattern? Very little change. Well, it's actually quite a huge change, really. But anyhow, <laughs> in, when we talk about 1% is it's moved more than 1%. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's quite, a few, <laughs> quite a few million bucks that that's changed. Quarter three, 13, we're waiting for the new iPhone 5, right? So we, Apple's problem with the iPhone, unless it agree with the iPad, we'll come to that, is the expectation of a new model, roughly September, October of every year. The impact on their sales for the quarter prior as people are waiting and waiting and hanging off for the new model, right? So different buyers are happening. So average sale price in here, I mean, this is just a really simple number, and I know that inside Apple they have quite detailed analytics to drill down further about what's going on, but even this simple number in your business should be looking at what is actually happening because you could, depending on the industries, I know they're diverse from accounting to building to to long to sports, etc. There's diverse industries here, but average sale price is something we should be really looking at and what how it's moving. Now, some of your businesses will have a seasonality aspect. Let me tell you, seasonality hardly impacts Apple. Um, it's such a minor impact into their issue, um, but this. This next model, the release aspect, is very much what is going on in that average sale price. And it has a huge impact. Like, it is only 3 or 4%, but that's actually millions in a bottom line impact that's going on. Because most of it in the US in particular, most of their sales are to carriers. Um, and the new model coming out means to get enough units through, they do have to drop it a little bit in that wholesale market space. And that's what that is telling you. But it's also telling you about product life cycle, about the fact of release, different buyers are going to buy the new iPhone when it comes out in September, October, or whatever month it is, no matter what. Uh, the locked on, rusted on, Apple devotees that have got to have the new model when it comes out, no matter what. And then there's others who can wait six and 12 months and get the, buy the iPhone 4S now when it's been superseded by the 5C or the 5S that are happy enough for different peak customers at different price points. So which customers do you want to do and what price point and how that is impacting? So the next, somebody. Yeah. Can I just ask, so does that mean that um, when they're going to bring out the latest model, that they're going to have that same Samsung and all the others. You know, this discussion was going on in the marketplace. Is the 5C a cheap phone? No. It's exactly the same. So, but people accepted it as a cheap phone. Right? And it's exactly the same price. The 5S is dearer. Right? But the 5C, the cheap phone, really colourful, but anyhow, um, it's exactly the same price. It's a premium product. 
and they have been able to successfully position that as a cheap vote. So I just think it's brilliant storytelling. Yeah, there's a bit of a buzz going on. Um, so they do look at the average selling price very intensively um, and make certain that it's heading in the right direction. So quickly, the iPad and the Mac. Can somebody tell me the stories for the iPad? Yeah. Four forty-nine. Yep. Four thirty-six. Okay. And the Mac. Four twenty-seven. Thirteen seventy-eight. Thirteen eighty-three. Okay. What's going on with the iPad? Yeah, but why? What's that telling you? What's happened? People are waiting for a new one. There is one other huge impact on the iPad. The mini. The iPad mini has had an impact of dropping that massively. So yes, there is a, a, a delay issue, not as big on the iPhone, um, the new model thing, but the biggest one is the iPad mini. Okay, so let's, the innovation aspect, they've created this cycle in the iPhone that they have to be coming out with a new model because otherwise their price would keep going that way. So they've created a market expectation now of a new model every 12 months. For the life of the product is fine. Beg your pardon? Because the life of the product is fine. Yeah. Right. So, so that is a good thing, it's keep driving the company but it's also potentially their Achilles heel as well, is that there comes a point that the innovation is just not quite as innovative and we sort of get blase about it and the price starts coming down and they become more of a commodity. Can't see that happening for a number of years, but there's no doubt that that has a potential. And in the iPad, the iPad mini, I'm not 100% convinced it's a great business idea. Now, I could be proved totally wrong because there's a segment of the market that it might be totally appropriate to, but it's certainly knocked around the iPad sales big time. Um, now, in the long term, that might have some other benefits too, that they're just selling so many iPad minis that the market wants it just a little bit smaller, etc. So you've got to, you can't ignore your market um, in no matter what business we're in. So that could be innovation, may or may not. But Average sale price. So the Mac, just really quickly, such a small part of the Apple business now. Um, iPhones are really where it makes its money. But the Mac, new model situation's happening there because the new model got released after. So it was definitely interesting. But this was the big one that happened in the Mac is that they were been, had been able to, without a new model, get an increased average sale in the Mac. Even though it's such a small segment of their business now, that was actually a huge achievement. Um, and it'll be intriguing to see what the next quarter figures show on the Mac with the new model out there. Quite a profitable, it's their most profitable on a per unit basis. Um, division is the Mac. Um, but average sale price, you are what you charge. It's interesting to drill into it. So, talking about value, you are what you charge, all of that aspect, and I know that um, there's um, a commercial cleaning business in the room, and I have had a strong family involvement in commercial cleaning. And I just wanted to give a little story of a commercial cleaning business um, that is being able to connect the value in a way that most cleaning companies are not doing. And as a result, get a, a premium price, but as a result, their average sale price has been able to increase in the last six years. So this business focuses on cleaning building sites prior to handover. So, we're, you know, 
multi-story unit apartment or industrial sheds and warehouses and factories or any of you know shopping centers those sort of things or prior to opening need to be clean now what to, and we do have a commercial cleaner business in the room so he's got an advantage on the rest of you but um, what do you think might be the most important thing that that cleaning business needs to do that might be able to get them a premium price. Anybody want to think, give me answers on that? Time, availability. Time, availability. For us, it would be OHS. OHS. What sort of industry are you? Builder, as well, yeah. builder. okay. OHS, yeah. So you're in a builder. What, what part of building are you? Commercial shopping. Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Building waste, yeah. Do you want to comment at all? <laughs> what? Quickly on time. <laughs> so, most of these are builders, construction companies, etc., are the customers that are employing the cleaning services. Um, so, obviously, on time and quickly, efficiently, a decent job. But aren't they all what every cleaning company is going to say? And do? You know, nine out of ten are going to be able to do and say. So that's not the source of premium profit, premium pricing. It's what gets you to the starting gate, right? So this company in, in Queensland has been doing it for number of years I've been waiting for it to be copied and it hasn't yet which has surprised me and I've told this story in so many speeches I'm also waiting for somebody to pick up on it as well but anyhow they don't so remembering we're talking of the bigger organ companies you know the Wattpacks of the wealthy Abbey groups the Grinley construction those sort of built fairly substantial buildings builders even some of the smaller commercial builders but still that sort of help is Doing. So, the source of premium profit, so this is where getting as to what's really going into your customer's mind is the point of what I'll talk about and then you can get value, then you can premium price. So in a building contract, when the builder is doing that construction for on behalf of whomever, their, their principal contract with the owner, shall we say, has as it is for those of you who have built and or in the building game building domestic residence, there's progress stages, there's progress claims that are put in at particular stages of the project. And one of those stages is called practical completion. Right? So it's PC in the industry. So practical completion in a lot of these bigger contracts is around when it's clean. Because if it's clean, and yes, obviously it's got to have all the other stuff, but it's got to be clean. It mightn't be the final white glove clean, but it's got to be the first round of cleaning is done before practical completion can be sought. Right? So practical completion for a builder, they want it as soon as possible because that impacts their cash flow. So if a cleaning company could say to a builder, we'll get a team in here and get it done so that you can get PC, and then when you've got PC, we'll have a bigger team that come in and actually finish the job. And you get PC a week earlier than you might have otherwise got it, even if it's only two days earlier. Is that gonna matter? to the builder? Absolutely. We're changing their cash flow through cleaning. And as a result, that cleaning company is around about 20 to 30 percent dearer than any other cleaning company just through understanding that. Nothing else. The job's the same. It's understanding what's value to the client and drilling into where does cleaning fit. 
So I use cleaning as an example, but it's whatever business game it is, it's really drilling into the value. It's not necessarily the core service that you do. And often it's nothing to do with the core service. It's not got anything to do with the cleaning standard that's done. So depending upon the job site, you know, there might only be five or six people that are in there, but then 20 are thrown in after PC's done. But they got PC, got that claim in, they're on the way, they're happy, and we're happy because we're getting an increased margin because we understand the value. We're connecting it with what's important to them. So in whatever business we are, we need to be connecting it to the value. We need to drill into that in, in some detailed manner to get to a premium price. So any questions, comments, observations on, on pricing that we've talked so far? Any? Steve, do you? <coughs> so, I got one. Yes. Apple. Um, why do we? Um, I'm an Apple fanatic. I just want to know why I spend more money on it than I should. And I wouldn't necessarily. And that's why I'm not, you know, for me personally, but a lot of us do. Yeah. I Can I just? Ask, I'm going to answer this question, but just bear with me as I come up this part of the world. So I'm going to answer it by a different example. So, do they, do you know about moleskin notebooks? So, sorry about that, Paul, putting that in front. So, moleskin notebooks. I've got two of them here. This one here is what's a moleskin notebook that syncs with Evernote. So the computer application, um, there's fine dots on the page and you take a photo of your Evernote app on your iPhone and it goes straight through to Evernote. That book, which you can't buy at the bookstand unfortunately, you can only buy online, is 36 bucks for that notebook. This one, pretty certain I bought this at the Sydney airport. Um, doesn't really matter, but prices are pretty consistent. Another Moleskin notebook is $25. These are my planning tools that, like Kim has his, these are my planning tools. Why am I paying 30 odd, 20 odd for a notebook? Why am I paying a thousand bucks, whatever it is, for a Mac? I just bought my daughter a Mac Air, it was $1,500 or something. I could have bought a Windows computer for much cheaper. So why am I paying for this Moleskine notebook? 30 odd bucks, 20 odd dollars. When I can get a notebook on the shelf beside it for probably six bucks or five bucks. It makes your life easier. Does, does this notebook make my life easier, really? What do you say? It's a brand. It's a brand. What, what is it about the brand? Quality. Quality. Yeah. How it makes you yeah. feel. Fantastic. That is 100% the correct answer. It's the only reason why we buy a lot of things that we buy, is the emotion that it makes us feel, right? Now there's a reason why I'm looking in the back here, because I wasn't going to use this example and so I didn't have it pre-prepared, but anyhow, I can't find it. When you buy one of these notebooks, there's a little leaflet in the back, which obviously I've taken out probably use somewhere else. And the leaflet tells the story of Moleskine, right? And it's really appropriate to answer the question about Apple. It tells the story that a lady in, no actually, what it says in the leaflet says that the Moleskine notebook is the heir and successor to the notebooks used by Picasso, Hemingway, Da Vinci, and there is another person, a poet, I can't remember the name, right? Heir and successor to the notebooks used by Da Vinci, 
Picasso, Hemingway. That sounds like they're the same notebooks. A lady in Milan in Italy in the early 90s went to some of the museums in the Europe and saw those notebooks of Picasso, of Hemingway, of da Vinci, um, and they are original moleskin, instead of this is just, it's not the moleskin leather anymore, um, and a, a certain type of paper with a binder device. Saw that and said, I wonder how I could make them. And she made them, got them, created, and then created the story, the heir and successor to, right? That business listed on the Italian Stock Exchange in the middle of the GFC, it was the only company to list that year on the Italian yeah. Stock Exchange. Right? And it came out as a result of figures are now public that the average profit margin on these books is 67%. And I'll still buy them tomorrow or next day. Right? She's getting far more than any other stationery maker in the world because she's been able to put a story around how people feel who are using these notebooks. They want to be identified with. Now, is that arrogant to say, oh, I want to be identified with Picasso, Hemingway, whatever? Is it arrogant that I want to be identified with the, the crazy one's image of Apple? But subconsciously, that's what we are wanting to. We want to have that identity. That's what, why we're doing, buying this. That's why we're paying the premium, because we want to some way feel connected to that. We want to be perceived as a thinker, maybe, or whatever, creative, I don't know. So it makes us feel something, and thus I will spend 30 odd bucks for a book that I could buy from Office Works for six or five or something and really do most of the job. So, <laughs> so yeah, so it's what makes us feel, and that's where the premium price. And even if we're in the most logic services of them all, even if we're an accountant, no, we've got to be thinking of how does our business, what do we make our customers feel? It's our emotions that we're the margins. Okay, thanks for that. That's a great question. So, and it gives me the opportunity to tell me one of my favourite stories. And then just by the way, that's a moleskin case too. I, you know, I've really spent money. So that got me good and proper. I don't even know how much I paid for that. So yeah, so that are my planning tools. So thank you. All right, fantastic. Guys, put your hands together, please, Mr. Major. Fantastic. I love that when you think about emotion and what makes people buy and um, what the triggers are and the feeling that surrounds things. I love that and I connected with that. Thank you, Steve.